morning, everyone. As, uh, thank you, thanks, James, for the too kind introduction. Um, yeah, my as James said, my back, I'm, a bi I'm in biology, and my background is sort of in conservation biology, which, and I've wandered into the world of ecosystem services. Um, so what I'm going to do today is to just briefly define what biodiversity is, which some of you will know. I'm How many of you have a natural science background? How many of you <laughs> have a social science background? How many of you have a humanities background? Okay, great. That's what I was assuming. Okay? Um, so what are the big, and then after we've defined what biodiversity is, I'm going to just very briefly talk about where it is globally and why it's decreasing and why that's a problem. And that links to this idea of ecosystem services. And finally, an extremely brief overview of how one might conserve biodiversity. So in terms of learning objectives, so by the end of the table today, you should be able to define what the term biodiversity means, and it's a multifaceted term. You should be able to describe the main patterns of biodiversity globally. You should be able to describe what are the main drivers of biodiversity loss, and to discuss why biodiversity loss matters. So without further ado, it's Monday morning, it's 9. Um, what's biodiversity? Anyone have any ideas? You don't count. Anyone else other than James? <laughs> Anyone have any idea? Yep. Animals and plants interactions. OK, so animals and plants. We've got animals, we've got plants. Um, we've got interactions between them. All part of it, certainly. Anything else? Yeah? A range of species in an ecosystem. What do you mean by a range? Sure, so amount of species in it. Yeah, that's, you pretty well hit what's the most commonly used definition of biodiversity, so the number of species. Can you, yeah? Excellent, yeah. So you've got, does everyone know what a species is? Broadly speaking. So species is like, well, we are a species, right? With things, broadly it's, it's an organism that only can breed with another organism. There's a lot, it's actually a lot of, fuzziness around that, but broadly speaking, you've got a Siberian tiger, won't breed with, um, uh, with Indian tigers, for example. They're different species. So broadly speaking, those are species. But within species, you've got genetic diversity. So for example, you might, um, you know, like, uh, for example, you might find that the Indian tiger populations north of India have, are better adapted I'm just making this up to cold, then to, um, whereas the ones in the south might be more adapted to the dry. They could still interbreed, but they have slightly different genetic makeup. Same thing with humans, right? People who come from the south tend to have slightly different adaptions. All same species, everyone can interbreed, but you've got different genetic variability. So you've got genetic variability, you've got species variability. Anything else? Someone mentioned ecosystems. Anyone have any idea what an ecosystem is? Again, we're, you're doing well so far. Any more ideas of what an ecosystem might be? Yep. Yeah, that's pretty well it. I mean, sort of a not a bad working definition of ecosystem is all, as you said, all the sort of life living in some area, and that area can be larger or smaller depending on sort of where you are. So it's and how they interact. So that can be a component of biodiversity as well. So basically, we've pretty well covered what I'm going to say. So bi biodiversity can be the number, so number of species, the relative abundance or spatial distribution of genotypes, so that's the genetic, of species, of functional groups, I'll get to that in a second, and of landscape units as well. So that's, again, the sort of ecosystem. So by number of species, right, you could have, um, number is obvious, you could have three different species, the black one, the gray one, the white one. You could have, but you, know, you might, another, what, what's often quite important is not just the number of species, but how they're distributed. 
are, so for example, in nature, you find that most species are really rare, so there aren't very many of them, and very few species are very common. You can think of, uh, you can pick examples of, I mean, of, for example, pigeons would be an example of something that are awfully common in cities. You'll find far fewer interesting birds, right? So you'll get, you can get different, dis um, you can get this sort of thing. You might find most individuals are of one species and just a few are of another species. So that's the relative abundance. Um, and you can get functional groups. So for example, if you think, again, of um, birds that eat insects can be thought of as being one functional group. Or birds that eat insects in Europe could be thought of as a functional group. They all roughly do the same thing. They all eat insects. There's, I don't know how many species of, of insect-eating birds. And there might be also, there's granivorous birds, so birds that eat grain. They have a different function in the ecosystem. And that, in some cases, can matter quite a lot. So you, can, you could argue that it doesn't matter how many species of insect-eating birds you have. What matters is that you have some insect-eating birds in reasonable abundance so they can eat the insects and deal with that part of the ecosystem. So that's functional groups. And get, that matters if we talk about um, ecosystem services. And landscape units. So um, again, this idea of an ecosystem, of a region, of um, if you think of mangrove forests, you could think of the boreal forest, you could think of, um, I don't know, Saharan deserts as being distinct landscape units. You've got a diversity of landscape units across the planet, and that's a component of biodiversity as well. So the law, but the, for the rest of, having said this, so there's a very, there's a broad definitions of biodiversity. Most people, most of the time, when they talk about biodiversity, they talk about the number of species partly because those, that's quite easy to measure. For the rest of this lecture, I'll mostly be talking about the number of species, but really most of this can apply to these different definitions. So another question, where is biodiversity? Broadly speaking, in the world. Where do we have most species? Again, using the species definition. Yeah, well done. That, that's. Broadly speaking, that's the answer. Most biodiversity is in the tropics. So I'll just show you a few patterns. Okay. So this is, um, we're now getting to the stage in the last 10, or year, 10 years or so, people have um, managed to assemble species range maps. So basically, where are spe different species located digitally? And so we now know um, for amphibians, birds, and mammals, where all of them are. So we know. So this is a map of global amphibian richness. You can see Amazon, bits of West Africa, little bits of Central America, Britain's looking rather amphibian poor. Um, and there's a definite trend to the tropics. Same thing for birds. Again, here you've got massive hot spots of richness in the Andes. Um, Again, the, there's, the, the, there's really much less going on on the poles. Um, for, uh, that's marine systems. For the oceans, we actually know much less. You can see there's some rather large squares. Um, it's very difficult to figure out what's actually in the oceans, but this is 2010 paper. Oh, before I forget, these things, DOIs, everyone know what a DOI is? Digital Object Identifier. Basically, if you copy and paste that into your web browser, and you're at the university, it'll take you directly to the paper. Um, all of the papers that I'm mentioning here are on elect available electronically from the Southampton catalog. So you, all you have to do is stick the DOI into Google, and it should get directly to the paper. So it's uh, sort of a quick and dirty way of linking to a paper. So this paper from 2010, this is the first global map of patterns of marine richness. And you, you again, just if you eyeball this, you can see, broadly speaking, it's the same thing. The tropics have more biodiversity, certainly for open ocean species. Um, and for things that live along coasts, it's more how shallow the seas are. So it's, and this seems to be driven by ocean temperature. But the long and the short of this, the takeaway is tropics, lots of biodiversity. And actually, if you look at Blighty, this is biodiversity action plan species, the things we're interested in. Uh, well, the things the government is actively trying to conserve. 
then also in the south and the east, which is, of course, where the people are. And we think the reason for this is, or we don't actually know, we, we think that the amount of energy in the system sort of that, um, is the reason why you have more biodiversity in the tropics. So the tropics have more energy, warmer areas have more energy, and that leads to more species. Why exactly? The answer, we don't actually know yet. But broadly speaking, energy, tropics, and in general, southern areas have more richness. So this holds for Britain as well. So that's biodiversity. We know what biodiversity is. We know broadly where it is. And it's currently decreasing. Um, and the rates, what, what that means is effectively the rate of species extinction is the gr greater than the rate of speciation, so um, formation of new species. So in nature, very few things are static. So species are always going extinct, and new species are always being formed. That's always going on. That has always been going on. That will always continue to go on. There's nothing inherently wrong with things going extinct. So if you can, these crit critters are all gone now, right? That was long before humans were around. But what's alarming about the current rate, about, about the, why people are, are worried about the loss of biodiversity is the rate. Um, Biodiversity loss currently is much higher than what it has been historically. So this is a figure from something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which came out in 2005, which sort of assessed, as the name suggests, the state of the world's ecosystems. Um, you can, don't know exactly where it comes from, but if you, again, if you Google it, you can easily find it. It's on, um, available online. So this just compares. This is the long-term extinction rate of mammals and marine species. So you could, probably hard to read, read this, but it says here, for every thousand mammal species, less than one went extinct every thousand years. So there's an extinction rate of, what does that work out to? 0.01%, something like that. The current extension rate for mammals is a thousand times higher than the historical average, which is worrying. And the projected future uh, extinction rate for mammals is 10 times higher than the current rate, so 10,000 times the historical extinction rate. That's why people are concerned. Um, it's not that there's extinction occurring, it's the rate that they're occurring. So we think this is, there have been various periods of great extinctions in the past. For example, when the dinosaurs ex went extinct, used due to some sort of cataclysmic thing, events like asteroid hitting, we think that what we've currently, basically, the humans that are here are the equivalent of an asteroid hitting the system. Um, and this will have, so the next bit theory is, no, sorry, we'll get to why it matters next. So why are we losing biodiversity? The main, the main reason is the loss of natural habitat. Um, anyone guess why? Why are we losing so much natural habitat? Sorry? Resource exploitation. Resource exploitation. Um, partly, for, certainly for things like timber, um, but what, there's a more fundamental reason. Yeah? Population growth, and what does that mean? What, why would we use up more land for what? Building houses, okay, partly urbanization, but it's, that's an issue in the developing world, but what else? Agriculture. That's the long and the short of it, is we, we are eating, we, we, we consume something, do you know the percentage? It's some sort of enormous percentage of primary productivity is consumed by humans. I can't remember the number. It might be as high as 60%. But that's, so this is just the trends that are going on. Again, this is um, data from 2010. This is maps of global forests, the one up there. And this is the rate of deforestation just between 2005 and 2010. And again, you'll, the lecture, this will all be on, online, won't it? So it'll be easier to see it. But there's places where up to over 10% of the forest has been lost in an area in just five years. Interestingly enough, in this case, none of it's occurring in Africa. Right? Um, quite of it's occurring in the Amazon, which might not surprise people. But they had extremely high deforestation rates in Canada which one doesn't really think of as being a, um, a place where, which is nuking its natural resources um, at any great rate. That's partly because of 
um, something called mountain pine beetles in British Columbia, which are this massive insect infestation, which is probably linked to climate change, which we'll get to in a minute, which has basically wiped out vast tracts of forest. Um, but yeah, there's very large losses of the boreal forest, actually, which is quite interesting. Um, and this is just a bit of an older paper, um, which points out why we're getting this. This is how agricultural production, this figure is the particularly interesting one. This just shows how cropland and pasture land has increased since 1960 to 2000. At the same time, as pesticides imports have gone up, as nitrogen use, the fertilizer, all of these things have been going up to keep track of the population. And as you'll probably hear in the food security lecture, this is not just an issue of people, um, more people being around, it's, peop it's people getting richer, right? As people get richer, they eat more meat. Um, and if you, if you eat meat, you need roughly 10 times as much land um, as if you're a vegetarian, because the cows need to eat. You get you, you roughly 10%. If you feed a cow something, it's, um, if you, you need, you need roughly 10 times as much um, corn, for example, to, p to feed a cow as if you eat it directly, of the, just because a cow you know, has to live. So this is, is only about a 10% conversion efficiency factor if you start eating meat. That's why meat diets have a greater impact than um, vegetarian diets. Um, and the other reason that biodiversity loss is, is likely to occur in the future, and I think the reason that those that the projected losses are predicted to be 10 times higher than currently is climate change. Um, how much time do we have here? Um, so how many, you've all had the lecture now on climate change, haven't you? Um, so you, you all know about this. Um, and basically, at the moment, climate change is only having a relatively minor effect. But the prediction is that after about 50 years from now, we'll start seeing really quite massive changes. And So this is a paper from 2007 by a guy named Walter Yetz. Um, I've actually given you a proper link this time. Um, so this, what, what they tried to do here was project how the effects of climate change and habitat loss, the two main drivers of extinction, were likely to affect bird populations globally. And if you're looking at future scenarios, or if you're looking at the future, you're basically making things up. So people call that scenarios. You, you say, well, what's... What's likely to happen? You never really know what's likely to happen. So what you usually do, you say, OK, well, let's be really, 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 really pessimistic and say, all right, we think the world's going to get utterly trashed. How bad could it possibly be? And then we say, well, on the other hand, let's say, what, let's look to see, let's be really optimistic. Let's assume all the climate change stuff works. Let's assume, assume we get our act together and the whole thing's sort out. Then how much are we going to lose? So you look at the extremes. And you kind of see, well, what, what's the worst case and the best case scenario? And these two, this adapting mosaic and order from strength 2100, these are both scenarios from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Adapting mosaic is one of these, is the sort of touchy-feely, everyone gets on and the whole system works quite well adapt, um, scenario. And order from strength is basically um, business as usual. Um, things continue to steadily get worse. You can see that and the, the, the light blue is the where, the where climate change is likely to have an effect, and where the red is where land use change is likely to have an effect. And you can see that under the order from strength scenario, the projections for the negative effects of land use change are much higher than under the adapting mosaic scenario, though in both cases, it isn't looking particularly good. Um, what's interesting here is that they argue that for birds, Again, because birds tend to be found in the tropics, the, the diversity is highest in the tropics, the current models, or current as of the models they used, suggest that climate exchange is going to have the greatest effect at the poles, right? That's where the extremes are. That's what their scenarios show. That actually, the effects that bird populations in 2100 are likely to be mostly affected by land use change. That climate change will affect some species, and some species very badly, but in general, it's land use change. And under these scenarios, I guess very large land use change in Africa is projected to occur, where there's some of the last remaining rainforests. Um, and this is, this, is, this, is, so this is where they predict 
some changes would occur. And here it's um, what they predict the impacts would be. So this is percentages of species that have, would have at least 50% of their range wiped out. And you can see here that it's particularly the African species that they, under these scenarios, would predict would be affected. Of course, this is, I mean, this is best guess stuff, really. It's based on realistic projections, but it's quite, it's very difficult to try to predict um, into the future what's going to happen because you've got, you, well, you've got as it's this, these linked socioeconomic um, complex systems. Are we going to hear more about that? Oh yeah, you'll hear more about that. Basically, that you don't, that things like land use change depend, depend on how, what the percentage of the population that's eating meat, right? It's not just how many, you can't just say we've got 50, or 7 billion people now, we'll have 10 billion in, in 2012, and assume that they all use the same amount of land as today. Um, you have to, and then you have to think, well, what's the land use change? So you've got these complex things, which is why you have these rather qualitative scenarios. It's actually quite qualitative science, or these projection, this projection business. But it's, that's sort of the best you can get at currently. So why should you care? if we lose biodiversity. And there's two arguments. One is that we are, that nature, writ large, biodiversity has a right to be here, as much of a right as we do. And we as a dominant organism on the planet um, have, hence have an obligation to make sure that it, has, it can coexist with us. We, you know, we have a right to exist, but because we can effectively determine whether things exist or not, we have a right, we have an obligation to do so. A lot of people would say, it's a bit of a pity if we lose a few owls, but eh. Um, you know, I, 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 I quite like a new car, and it's quite nice going on holiday, and why shouldn't people in China also have nice cars and go on holiday? And indeed, why shouldn't they? So why, 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 what, there are more pragmatic reasons. And this is where the issue of ecosystem service comes in. So let anyone guess what ecosystem, well, James has broadly defined it, um, what ecosystem services we might depend on. Medicinal plants, Medicinal plant. sure, okay. Now people, um, so you, there's, there's quite a bit about that, you know, like, like, I don't know what percentage of cancer drugs come from the Amazon or something like that. There are bigger ones, what else? Yeah, that's great. The, uh, mangroves are a good example of a system that provides some really important ecosystem service. So you could arguably fisheries are an ecosystem services um, in themselves. And what those fisheries depend on might be other things like within what's going on in the mangrove. But so fish, for example, are an ecosystem service. There's something we get. Ecosystem services are broadly speaking the benefits we get from nature. So fish would be one. Medicinal plants, anything else? There's some really big ones. Oxygen, yes, excellent. Um, so at, at the limit, really, um, we're completely dependent on ecosystem service. If there was no plants, there'd be no oxygen and we'd all be dead. Um, we don't really worry about oxygen. And I, I think that's because the argument is, a, I'm not actually quite sure why we don't worry about oxygen, but I think they think that, that there'll always be some sort of green stuff that produces oxygen, no matter what we do to the system. But there are other, other more, there are other examples as well. But what 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 else might be important that we get from nature? Yeah. Air. Well, that would be ox again oxygen. Um, what about climate change? Any effect for climate change? Excellent. Yeah. What's what's a carbon sink? Yeah, that's right. So, the, so carbon, so forests are an important. I think it's something like 20% of global emissions come from deforestation, degradation. So, if you stop that, and not only can you stop it, if you have, under certain scenarios, if you plant trees, you're taking carbon out of the air. So that's an important one for climate change. And you've all now been convinced, I imagine, by um, how about the nasty effects of climate change. Um, Anything else? 
Excellent, yeah. Um, so there's water cycle in itself. I'll move through now to ecosystem services. The water cycle links to various ecosystem services, and I'll just get to this in a minute. Um, so we've, I think you're getting the idea now. The term is actually quite old. It comes from the 70s, from Stanford. Um, and, but it wasn't until the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 19, 2005 was published that the term really became, um, came into policy. It sort of got massive traction in policy now. It's a funny example of where governments want answers well ahead of the science. Um, usually scientists are saying, oh, you know, uh, you need to listen to this, you've got all this information, and governments are like, yeah. Um, it takes a while for it to filter to policy. In this case, because of this benefits humans get from nature, I think governments think it's quite an easy thing to sell to people, and they want answers, and there aren't any in most cases. So this paper in 1997, um, which I don't have a link to, but if you put the guy, title into Google, you'll easily find it, um, sort of put ecosystem servers on the map. So these, this uh, an economist, Bob Constanza, he actually gave a talk at Southampton last year, I don't know if any of you saw it, um, who wrote this paper and he estimated that the tr yearly global value of ecosystem services would be 16 to 54 trillion dollars, which I think is two or three times the global GDP. Um, this answer, this arguably is, there's, I think from an economic point of view, there's serious issues with this paper. Uh, there's all kinds of issues with the paper, but it really got people thinking. Basically, so it got people thinking that nature has, provides things that um, would be hard to replace, and there's a lot of value to them. So this is, this diagram here is from something called, well, it's from this paper here, from, um, which, again, there's a link to. But it's also, I believe, a version of this paper is found in something called the UK National Ecosystem Assessment, or the UK NEA. So the UK has just done an assessment of its ecosystem services because DEFRA is dead keen to do management based on ecosystem services. Um, the answer is we don't know the results for most places, but anyways, they found one of these things. And this is kind of the current thinking about how one links ecosystem services to people. So getting back to the water cycling idea, we can have water or nutrient cycling, so an ecosystem process, which in turn gives you things like clean water provision. Also, if you think about it, you could have flood regulation. Um, ecosystems can provide flood regulation. If you start paving over the wrong bits of hillsides, you'll get a lot worse flooding downhill because the ecosystem isn't there to soak up the rain or you don't have trees in the right place, the wrong place. You can have flood regulation services, which in Britain are quite a big deal, obviously. Um, so you've got various services that link to the water cycle. So clean water provision is an ecosystem service, and, but then it becomes a good, something that people use after you add some sort of usually capital input. So if there's clean water in a stream, it becomes a drinking water once you, well, usually put some sort of pipe in and, turn and add it to the local water supply that you might your input might be as simple as going like that and drinking it, depending where you are. And it has value to people. And usually, the ecosystem services, um, the current uh, thinking is that people put economic value on them, like Costanza did, um, which is something the UK NEA does. But you don't have to. You can put just sort of plus minus value or just in terms of people's life satisfaction. And you get things like, for example, birds. Wild bird species. So biodiversity can be, a, can be an ecosystem service. So if you look, look at this one here, in this case, you've got um, the, the wild bird species is the good. It's not, um, and the reason it's a good is that there's people out there, and certainly a lot of them in Britain, and you've got a million members of the RSPB, who are just happy because there's wild birds out there, right? They go out to see them, and in some cases, which is something called amenity value of nature. So, and um, in some cases, they're just happy that there is wild nature out there. So how many of you are happy to think that somewhere out there, there are tigers or lions? How many of you would pay money for conservation of tigers if someone told you, um, you know, if you contributed up 10 pounds a year, 
we'd be able to keep tigers in perpetuity. How many pe people here would be happy to do that? So basically, we've got, that's something called existence value. You're, um, you're getting a, a, a benefit from something that you never see, right? You might never actually see those tigers, but you're, you're happy to think they're somewhere out there. So there's these direct benefits, like water cycling, but also biodiversity can be thought of as having ecosystem services through existence value or through um, amenity value. Does that sort of make sense? Long and the short of it is, people get various ecosystem service benefits from nature. Some of them are very direct ones, like agriculture production is thought of as an ecosystem services, ecosystem, so anything you eat. Um, fisheries, timber, all of those, those are called, um, oh goodness, uh, provisioning services. Um, and then you've got regulating services, like water regulation services, and then you have these cultural services, such as amenity value of biodiversity. And things like medicinal plants would fit in um, under provisioning services. So now all of that's um, all very interesting, but how well does biodiversity, so species richness, or richness of various bits of biodiversity linked to ecosystem services? And you can think, so there is generally a positive effect, but you can, you can probably think of examples, for example, if you want to get timber, if you want to maximize timber production, what do you do? I mean, I'm assuming none of you are foresters, but broadly speaking, probably the best thing to do is to take some large area of natural forest, chop down all the trees, turn them into wood, and then grow some sort of possibly um, foreign species which grows really fast, such as eucalyptus, and cut it down every 10 years. That maximizes your return on investment for timber. It's terrible for biodiversity, probably pretty bad for most of the other ecosystem services, but in that case, you can maximize a particular service, um, at least for some time, by in a very low biodiversity way. Um, but if you start thinking about multiple services across, then the relationship becomes, um, biodiversity becomes more important. So there's something called the rivet hypothesis, um, which is, I think was came out from John Locke and his is he still our chief scientist? He used to be. No, he's not. Anyway, um, a relatively well-known British scientist. Um, who, 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 the idea is basically that biodiversity is, if you, if you think of it, it's like an airplane. You can fly along, and if you lose a rivet from an airplane, that's fine, nothing happens. You lose a couple more rivets, nothing happens. But at some point, you lose one extra rivet, the, plane, the wing will come off, and the whole thing will obviously not go do so well. That's the same idea. That's getting to this idea of functional diversity. That once you, you can lose one or two insect-eating birds, that's fine. But once you've lost all the insect-eating birds, you might be in a situation where suddenly your pest numbers go right up, your insect numbers go right up, which would have rather negative effect for people. Um, so functional biodiversity so tends to be, that seems to be more important than species um, richness per se. This is a, um, Basically, they looked across 445 studies. This is now actually a relatively old paper. I think there's some newer ones out as well. Um, and a meta-analysis simply, simply means that they did an analysis of existing studies and looked what the sort of balance of evidence was. So most biodiversities in the tropics and most threatened biodiversities in the tropics, this is, again, recent paper, so this is a problem, right? Because tropical countries are generally poor and they have the fewest resources to conserve the biodiversity we all depend on. So how do we conserve biodiversity? This is a global, just a global poverty map. What, so James, what's Kate talking about next week? Is she doing? Okay, she's doing the donut, all right, that's fine. Um, oh, it's Kate. Ah, not Schreckenberg, the other Kate. Okay, right, sorry. Um, just want to not overlap too much with what's going to happen next week. So we've got this issue, right? You've got most of the biodiversities in the tropics, most threatened biodiversities in the tropics. You've got lots of countries that don't have a massive amount of money. Um, and in many cases, the ecosystem services we depend on, such as carbon, um, for global climate regulation, affect us all. It doesn't matter where you 
grow forests, to suck up carbon, um, the important thing is happening somewhere. So we've got an issue here. How, how do we conserve biodiversity? Anyone have any ideas? What, what, what should be done? Do, should the poor country simply be told, oh well, you, you know, you, 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 it's bad luck, but um, you just, you know, you've got, you've got all this biodiversity because you haven't gone out and produced lots of cars yet. Um, just keep it there. How, how, what, what, can people think of a mechanism? What, what should we do? Yep, so you've got, okay, that's certainly going, that's the argument. So how does that relate to on the ground conservation? Where would they, what would that mean in sort of practical terms on the ground? Would that company then, what would they do then? Would they pay people to plant the trees? Yeah, again, I'm not quite sure how these things always work, but I suspect, any, anyone else on that, on that front? I mean, that's... I suppose that kind of, you know, green ethic that's emerging is, I guess, a recognition that it's unfair for poor countries to shoulder the whole burden of conserving biodiversity. What else, more formally, what could one do? Right. Yeah, so that's, you can, I mean, that's, that's there's this, carbon credit trading schemes. Um, so people are talking about how to trade for carbon and helping other countries. So that's broadly what's being proposed. It's broadly called something called payment for ecosystem services. So what people are proposing, and carbon is the best example, um, under something called RED, is effectively, um, well there's different, different versions of this as well. So RED is, part of the UN, of the global climate negotiations. It's called reducing emissions from degradation and forest, deforestation and forest degradation. Um, and it's actually moved now to something called Red Plus, where they're trying to also conserve um, biodiversity per se. And again, because people pointed out that you can do a lot of carbon conservation by planting eucalyptus, which absolutely is terrible for biodiversity, but it's good for carbon. So they they've started to realize that if you start just prioritizing one thing, you're likely to have rather negative impacts on the other thing, so it's a bit more holistic. But effectively what it is, is these countries here, the red countries, um, which are all countries which are quite poor, which have reasonably large areas of tropical forest, um, stand to be paid to conserve that forest or to plant new forest. And the mechanism for that is effectively the countries which produce carbon, as in us, um, and the industrialized north more broadly, would pay national governments um, of these countries relatively large amounts of money have been proposed because it is a lot of carbon, um, using global carbon to, to maintain forests. And basically, your countries are being compensated for um, protecting this global good. You can do this more um, for, on a smaller scale as well. There are examples in Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica is sort of the poster child of this. Costa Rica is the poster child of most conservation, where they've, the government there has, um, is pays farmers to, to uh, keep forests uh, which are in watersheds that are of value, where the cities get their drinking water from or from biodiversity. Um, Nestle actually has, um, they have, a, I can't remember which spring it's now. It's one of their name brand water is in a spring in France, and they realized that the farmers who were above the spring were putting too much nitrogen on the ground, that they were risking that spring having too much nitrogen. And it's the whole spring, that the water that comes from that spring, um, they can't filter it under French law, otherwise it isn't a mineral water anymore, so Nestle started to lose a lot of money. So what they did effectively was set up a program where farmers, where they invested a lot of money 
to help farmers shift from nitrogen intensive fertile um, farming to low intensity farming, basically um, old style grazing. So they're paid, they're paying the farmers effectively to help maintain the purity of the, of the spring. Um, so these things can exist at quite small scales, quite large scales. They can exist, they don't have to just be in tropical countries. Um, and broadly, sp I mean, it, another form of these sorts of things is uh, for cons global conservation efforts. So if, uh, if you think of national parks in a lot of the, um, the developing world, will largely be, will be funded um, through, um, through northern governments um, helping to pay for these things to be um, kept up. So this is, there are a lot of problems with this, with all of these things. There's issues, you, anytime you do something like this, you, you end up messing around. Um, it, it seems like quite a good idea from a sort of a purely social, uh, from a purely sort of physical science point of view. It's quite, and it's quite easy to come up with, you know, ways of optimizing where you conserve the carbon and all that sort of thing. The thing is though, if you, for example, if you, in, um, if you start increasing, um, if you give a government a lot of money to conserve forests, then effectively they have more power over that forest. And you may, f what may end up happening is that local communities who might, might be suddenly told, you can't use your forests anymore because um, the government's, you know, getting a lot of money for these things, um, you know, keep out, um, which could actually increase poverty in people, if people are quite dependent on these forests. And people tend to be, uh, poor people tend to be most dependent on local ecosystem services. So there's all kinds of issues of equity around these things. But in general, I think it's still somewhat promising. So just to summarize, we're coming to the end now. Biodiversity is multifaceted. The number of species is the most frequent measure, but there are lots of ways of looking at it. Biodiversity is in the tropics, broadly speaking. It's declining, and the issue isn't that it's declining per se, it's the rate of um, decline that's the problem. Agricultural expansion and climate change, are agricultural expansion as in habitat loss, so that's natural habitat, forests, savannas, all that sort of thing, is the biggest current driver. Climate change is a major future threat. And biodiversity matters because we depend on it. And conserving biodiversity is hard as the countries with most biodiversity have the least resources to conserve it. Does anyone have any questions? I think that's, yes, that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions? We've got about, officially I think we're done. So if you have to leave, um, by all means do so. But if you, anyone has any questions? And I believe my email address is up, so if anyone has any questions as, as well, then uh, feel free to email me. And thanks for the uh, good level of involvement. Thank you. <laughs>